Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, uh, the stock market, like Elizabeth Taylor in the Wall Street Journal, is always the same, yet always different. Um, every great cycle is, is like every other great cycle, and yet every one is unique. Um, uh, I stand before you this morning um, as the world's leading authority. Uh, Lou did mention this in his very generous introduction. As the world's leading authority in where stock prices are not going. Um, uh, they go up, I say down. Uh, one of these days we'll get in sync, but perhaps uh, not for a very long time. Um, I'd like to talk today in the six hours that Lou has generously given me on uh, the present day speculative environment, uh, what putatively has brought it about, what actually has brought it about, um, and uh, in general to uh, try to shed some light on this, the, the greatest, lustiest, and most flummoxing, uh, to me, moment in American financial history. Um, I'd like also to, uh, uh, to review um, uh, exactly how we got here um, and to ask uh, not least one question that on Wall Street never seems to be asked, namely, um, uh, what, if any, is the distinction between uh, central banking as practiced by our Fed and central planning? Um, if uh, fixing the federal funds rate isn't price fixing, what might it be? And if indeed Alan Greenspan and company have uh, discovered the uh, precise rate to uh, guarantee American financial prosperity, uh, where did the Soviets go wrong? Um, and, um, and how, if they have not done this, what accounts for this massive suspension of disbelief on the part of people who are almost worshipful of the Fed? And in that context, I propose to uh, uh, talk about the parable of the World Wrestling Federation, which is going public. Any wrestling fans in the audience? <laughs> All oh, right, nobody's going to admit it. Okay. <laughs> um, to begin with, the speculative setting, um, you know, where to begin, I stand in awe, and one is, uh, is profoundly humbled if you're a practitioner in markets. Every day brings a new humiliation, uh, otherwise known as a learning experience. Um, uh, people talk about a bubble, which to me connotes uh, something feeble, insubstantial, or flimsy, but it's hardly flimsy that... Uh, uh, since the beginning of 1998, the market value of the six biggest and most popular technology stocks has, uh, has tripled, uh, taking them up to $1.65 trillion, which, as Jake Lamotta used to say, is a lot of money even when you say it fast. Um, the increase in the valuation of these six, that is this $1.65 trillion, is greater than the entire U.S. stock market capitalization as recently as 1982, at the beginning of the great Reagan bull market. In fact, um, uh, since 1995, which is not so very long ago, uh, the market capitalization of these same six stocks, you know, Microsoft, Intel, Dell, uh, Send, uh, 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 Cisco, Lucent, uh, the market cap of these same six has, uh, uh, has, has gone, what, um, sixfold or something, maybe more than that. Um, on one day recently, that is the 3rd of September, there was a bullish employment report uh, released by the government. On this one day, the six appreciated in market terms by $63 billion, uh, which was the in $10 billion more than the entire market cap of the 10 biggest tech stocks in 1990. So to recapitulate, on one day, uh, September 3rd, there was a greater increment of market value added to six than existed uh, for 10 in 1990. So when people talk about a levitation or a bubble, they really don't exaggerate. These things have never been seen before. A, a, a bull market of this order, uh, a speculation this massive, um, a, a credit structure quite this extended, I'll get into that later, has never before been seen. This is all new. Um, it is um, an elemental force, and uh, to be on the wrong side of it, as I've been, is, is, I say, quite humbling. And I stand before you with many more questions than answers. Um, you know, why? What has caused this? Um, if we understand that, perhaps we can think more about, more clearly about the future. Um, it seems to me that, that, that the one uh, evergreen answer uh, offered uh, to that question is, is that technology has delivered us into a new age. Uh, cyclicality is no longer a feature of markets. Uh, we have reached a kind of permanent high plateau of prosperity. Stability is no longer um, uh, this kind of will of the wisp. It is upon us, and uh, it's stability uh, with a difference. That is, that nothing at all stable about the 
a national wealth it, it forever accretes. Um, the internet is a wonderful institution. Is it any more wonderful than electricity uh, uh, that preceded it? Um, uh, thinking about technology, I have thought a bit about an invention uh, without which um, the Mises Institute would not have been below the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, when Willis Haviland Carrier was awarded patent number 808897 for an apparatus for treating air, this is 1906, little did he imagine uh, the consequences of thing we would call air conditioning. Um, and air conditioning, when you think about it, is a, is a great parable of technology. It has delivered uh, uh, innumerable benefits. It has it is made life from Bombay to Baltimore tolerable. Um, it has uh, uh, infinitely expanded uh, uh, the wealth of the United States. It has changed migration patterns in the United States. It has delivered up to civilization Orlando and Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, it has given us the 12-month congressional session. <laughs> Where would the institution of American statism have been without the air conditioner? Oh. Um, there are uh, debits and credits for every single technology. The internet has facilitated the dissemination of American nuclear secrets around the world. It has given us Lou Rockwell not once a day, not twice a day, but many times a day. So what is the net of technological advance? It isn't just debit, it's not just credit, but there is a net. There's a net effect of technology. More than that, uh, the, the bulls, the super bulls, the unconditional bulls on equities and on the internet and revolution have, have told us that, uh, um, that, in effect, the progress is seamless, not cyclical. Is that so? If, 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 you, if you look at the, at, at the revolution in air conditioning, what you find is that it didn't work. Um, in 1930, it didn't work commercially. In 1933, a carrier had to suspend production of its then revolutionary room air conditioner because no one was buying them. Ah, you will say that was a depression. Well, yes, I say it was a depression, but note that innovation did not forestall the depression. So those who would contend that a new age has been delivered by technology are arguing... Um, without facts, uh, electricity um, uh, coming into commercial application 100, say, years ago uh, produced the, theoretically the, doubled or tripled the, uh, the work day, which I guess is a good thing. Was that not productivity? What was, of course it was. The automobile and so forth and so on. All these things have immensely enriched human life, but they have not delivered us from uh, what we know on... Wall Street as ups and downs, to speak technically. Um, so I submit to you that technology alone um, can't explain uh, stock market valuations and stock market uh, speculation that is literally unprecedented, I think, in, in, in all markets and in all countries, perhaps Japan accepted 10 years ago. Uh, so what then might explain this? And technology explains in part this is indeed an age of miracles. Um, Life is ever so much easier than it had been only a generation ago, but that alone cannot explain uh, what could be called, I think, fairly a bubble. Well, there is a, another and, and a, a, a much more pedestrian observation we made of, about American uh, financial markets and the American financial prosperity, and that is that uh, Wall Street has found a benefactor in the federal government. Um, uh, federal subsidy of credit expansion is a very, very important element in this unique moment in American finance. Um, uh, the Federal Reserve System is, is um, uh, institutionally is a bank, and you can examine its balance sheet. They publish it weekly, unaudited. Bert Ely will see to that one of these days. But if you add up the assets in the Fed uh, and do a year-over-year -year check of its growth, the Fed has expanded its footing, its balance sheet, by almost 10%. Was well, the economy growing at 10%? Why is the Fed expanding its, its assets? Why is the Fed delivering the stimulus to an economy that shouldn't need it, right? I mean, this is a new age. So the, the Federal Reserve System is, 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 is an author or a co-author of the financial underpinnings of this great speculation. Uh, then, too, there are the so-called government-sponsored enterprises, the handmaidens of the Fed, um, outfits that uh, 
uh, do a very brisk financial business. They are beloved on Wall Street because they are what is known in the trade as a great account, uh, but which also must be uh, uh, included on any list of financial benefactors to the American speculator. Uh, to pick one of the biggest, uh, Fannie Mae, the Federal National Mortgage Association. Fannie Mae um, expanded its balance sheet in the 12 months ending June 30th by about 25%. Its mortgage portfolio is up around 40%. Now, the Fannie Mae is not creating credit, but it's facilitating the creation of credit by other institutions. Ditto uh, the home loan banking system. Ditto Freddie Mac, which has just hired our former leader, Newt Gingrich, as a consultant. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one important observation about our prosperity is it is that it is subsidized in part. Uh, credit is expanding briskly, money supply is expanding briskly. The broadest measure of money supply, M3, is growing or has been growing by upwards of 9.5% or so over the past couple of years. Uh, so, yes, there is, in fact, um, uh, a great miracle being wrought in the business of production. Uh, but there is also uh, terrific fuel being poured into the engine of speculation. And you know, every great bull market um, uh, has a proximate cause. It has a reason. I mean, people don't, didn't imagine that the automobile did great things in the American economy in the 20s. People don't imagine now that the microchip has done wondrous things for the economy in the 90s. But there is more to it than innovation. Um, I promised you uh, at the start um, uh, the parable of the World Wrestling Federation um, and to tie this into the actions um, of our Federal Reserve Board. Um, uh, thanks to the internet, you can go online and uh, do keyword searches. And I suggest you might try the following experiment right in your own homes as we've done at Grants. Um, ask the, uh, the computer who knows so much, ask him, her, uh, to find, uh, to match the words Greenspan and God. <laughs> and um, uh, as the book end to this exercise, ask the same omniscient thing to uh, match for gold and Nazi. Um, again, you will not come up empty-handed. Um, uh, the market collectively, individuals en masse, have, have credited a federal bureaucracy with powers of intuition, of knowledge, and of foreknowledge that um, uh, are unique in the history of the public sector. Um, Alan Greenspan was once a fellow in a business suit uh, trying to make a living by telling the future, and, and he didn't fill many rooms. He was a, a good economist. Uh, uh, but he was an ordinary guy who got up in the morning and went to work. How did it happen that Alan Greenspan uh, became omniscient? Did, can anyone pinpoint the moment? Uh, was there a federal program in which he participated? What, what, what was, was there like adult education? What, what caused this? How is it that federal employees meeting in committee can set the one interest rate ostensibly that brings us unchecked and no longer cyclical financial progress and 20% uh, and per year compounded rates of return in the stock market. Well, it, it's, it, it's absurd when you talk about it, isn't it? It simply doesn't make sense. And I, I, don't, I think that I could ask any political, any audience uh, with any politics to, to, cons to, to try imagine the implausibility. This is not merely a, a libertarian or Austrian perception. Um, it simply doesn't make sense. Well, well um, uh, the suspension of disbelief is one of the secret engines of American speculative prosperity. Um, when um, Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, meets the executioner and um, there is a double flying drop kick laid on him or somebody breaks a chair over Stone Cold said, we, we don't think that somebody's going to the hospital really, do we? <laughs> Wrestling fans, of whom there are millions in this country, suspend disbelief willingly for the pleasure of the entertainment. Um, now we find in the pending public offering of the World Wrestling Federation the perfect parable of the Federal Reserve, Dow 11,000, and this moment in finance. Um, 
a little like day trading or speculation by the public, uh, the World Wrestling Federation has come from nowhere into ubiquity. Um, financial results of the past five years show revenues on average in the first three years of $85 million per year. Last year, there were $250 million. World Wrestling lost money in two of the three years, 95 and 97, those first three years were a period. It made $30 million or so last year. The underwriters proposed to capitalize this company at 150 times the average of the past five years net income. What, by this they mean to say that wrestling is no longer cyclical. They mean to tell us that it will continue as it has been for the past 12 months. They mean us to uh, overlook the fact that wrestling, like so many other uh, entertainments, has, has, has had in its moments in the sunshine, its moments in the shade. Roddy Rowdy Piper was not a centimillionaire on the strength of his performance. Um, and presumably this issue will blow out the door like so many have because people are willingly suspending their disbelief. Now, um, I'm going to stop in a moment and I'd love to take a question or two if you have any. Um, again, I, I stand before you not as a dogmatic um, savant um, about markets. Uh, if you are in the business, you are necessarily humble. It's not uh, uh, something that you have acquired on Sunday mornings. It is a very uh, humbling business, this Wall Street business. Um, but I do, it, so uh, to contend is, I guess you will hear others contend that the market is wrong and that oneself is right is a very, very uh, big and bold claim, especially in view of some of our track records. But that is, in fact, my conviction. And let me try to, in winding up, let me um, uh, try to strike an Austrian theoretical note in the context of the present day market and the present day bubble. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the hot new books out in the stock market, and there are a myriad of them, is something called Dow 36,000. Two very smart people have written it. One is uh, James Glassman, a nice guy I know, he's American Enterprise Institute. And they contend that um, uh, the stock market has systematically been undervalued by Americans who have not seen that the risks of owning equities over a 20-year holding period are, in fact, paradoxically lower than the risks of owning government securities. It is their uh, assertion that stocks ought to be three times higher on aggregate than they are now. And they propose that uh, any moment, uh, a tripling of the market will begin. Um, now, um, it seems to me that many arguments can be arrayed against this. In fact, we try to do that in the issue of grants I think you have back there. But I think the central and most interesting fallacy from the point of an, of an Austrian analysis is that these fellows don't see the market as something uh, that um, uh, they don't see market action and market valuation as having consequences apart from um, a theoretical uh, marker of one's own wealth. They don't see that if stocks were tripled, uh, then people's behavior would change and that the architecture of the economy, as it were, would be, uh, would, would be um, corrupted. Um, the easiest way, to me, of imagining what would happen if they were right is to say, what would happen if real estate values tripled tomorrow? Well, people would build, right? They'd build, like, they'd build, and, they'd build and they'd overbuild. There would be a massive credit expansion to finance the construction of real estate, now triple in value. Uh, landlords, uh, however, would have to fight to keep their tenants, right? Because the, the population of tenants wouldn't triple. So rents would come down, landlords would cut rents, uh, profit margins would shrink, and at the end of this bubble, uh, the real estate business would be worse off than it had been before values tripled. In other words, the change in the value of an asset class uh, generates changes in the way people capitalize themselves and, and capitalize their businesses and in the, and, and the, and the structure that the economy takes. It becomes much more capital intensive if you mark up the value of capital. And I will leave it to people much more knowledgeable about the theory of this than I to, to elaborate on that as the days go on. Um, there is no quarreling with the result of the financial environment in which we are privileged to live. Uh, it has been merely stupendous. But as the French say, uh, the practice is fine, but what about the theory?
so with that, um, I would, I got a few minutes. I'd love to take a question or two. Um, yes, sir. The question is on uh, this confection called the euro, the pan-European fiat currency. Um, the United States dollar is the ivory soap of monetary brands. It is, uh, uh, it has market share. It has, um, um, it has. Um, Everything that an advertising agent could want in a product, the dollar possesses. It, it, it is virtually the monopoly money of the world. Um, this has caused no end of irritation of people who don't live in the United States. Um, uh, if you remember back to the 60s and the 70s, uh, the United States would rather high-handedly, periodically, change the value of the dollar at the expense of the economies of continental Europe and Asia. So the, the impetus for the creation of a euro, and this goes back to the snake and other monetary adventures in the 60s, the impetus for this was in good measure political. Um, Europeans were tired of an imperial dollar and wanted a bit of their own. Um, Jacques Rueff, who was a very solid thinker about monetary matters, uh, deplored um, uh, in the 20s the imperial British pound, he deplored in the 50s the imperial American dollar, and uh, these pleadings were heard and Europe set to work to create a com competitor currency. It wants to create a currency that will serve as a reserve unit for the world in competition with the dollar. You know, is the euro something that, uh, that one should hold or would hold? I don't know. I, I, I have a blind spot in monetary matters. I, am, so I, I should confess my own personal financial interests. I'm very bullish on small cap the small Japanese stocks, because I think they're being given away or have been given away. And I'm very bullish on gold. The, the first idea is working. The second idea is hopeless. <laughs> gold is the, is the dog of dogs. And uh, if the bears think they're bearish on it, and they're disgusted by it, they ought to talk to the bulls. We can't, I can't stand it anymore. But I buy it because I think that... Uh, uh, that in a world of competitive valuations, in a world of very insubstantial monetary systems, that gold will one day reclaim some measure of market share in this, in this monetary marketplace. So I think that the euro is not the worst idea for Europe, given the politics of the situation. I have absolutely no confidence that this band of bureaucrats in Europe will fix on the right quantity of money, the right credit arrangements, the right interest rate. You know, I, I think they're doing things that are wrong that the Fed has done. It wasn't very well. I think that they are making many of the same mistakes the Fed has made. But I think unless you see it in the context of political competition, you can't properly handicap the race. So I think that the, you know, the Germans want a weak euro, the French, for reasons of prestige, want a strong euro. Everyone wants a euro that will compete with the dollar, and a part of me thinks that they ought to have that. Uh, yes, sir. This is the saddest story ever told. <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the things that should have made gold up, go up and haven't. Um, I'm thinking about the, uh, uh, the currency, serial currency disaster uh, of 1998. I'm thinking about the um, uh, disestablishment of the Deutschmark, one of the few relative success stories in post-war fiat monetary annals. I'm thinking of the record and growing U.S. current account deficit. I'm thinking of stupendous institutionalized short positions by producers. I'm thinking about the stupid mispriced facilitation of that short selling by central banks through gold lending operations. None of this matters except to assure a new low in the bullion price. There is no market like a bear market. And the only, I mean, I, I own this stuff. I own mining shares. I will continue to own them. Some of the mining shares have done pretty well considering the gold price. The only thing I can, I can say is that it acts miserably. It's not validating the bullish theory, and we have to be clear-headed that it's not working. On the other hand, 
things often don't work before they do work. In January of 1980, gold bullion spiked $850 an ounce. The United States was on the verge of a Weimar inflation. You could see it. You can read it in the marketplace. Well, nuts. It was not. You should have sold gold and bought bonds, right? Bonds were 9%. Well, bonds proceeded to go to 15% after they should have gone down in yield. That's what lends the poetry and the majesty and the mystery to what we do in Wall Street. It, it, it never works. It's always flummoxing. You never get it in a good night's sleep if you're invested. So, well, it's not exactly true. The weekends are okay. So, I, I am firm, I'm a firm believer in the ultimate vindication of this idea that gold will reclaim a monetary role that has been denied it by, again, the same suspension of disbelief. Um, but um, it is a veil of tears. Uh, one more. Yes, sir. Um, you know when that might be, do you? <laughs> oh, I, mean, I, th- I think the Fed will be aggressively easy, meaning it will aggressively chop the one thing it can chop, the federal funds rate. Um, it did so, it's done so every time it has had the pretext. And uh, it doesn't always work. The Bank of Japan cut rates now to their zero. And it was a very long, it was, it's been 10 years in that market. Um, interest rates were sensibly zero in this country during the 30s. Um, um, but to answer your question, I do believe the Fed will aggressively intervene to uh, reduce interest rates and to uh, facilitate a credit expansion in the face of a very dramatic fall in stock prices. Uh, one and all, I thank you. I thank you for your indulgence with my uh, uh, hurricane-induced uh, uh, time and exit. Thank you. Mm-hmm.